Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here talking to you today about uh, the gallery upstairs on the third floor of the Americas. Um, it's in the central space, and um, the show has just been extended to July. Oh, I can't see you now. <laughs> it's all gone dark. Um, and uh, yeah, the show has just been extended until July. So uh, if you haven't gone up, you still have a little bit more time. Uh, what I'm going to do today is give you a really deep gallery tour, I guess. Um, if I was going to give you this um, lecture in the space, we would be looking at um, real objects, and here they're on the slide, but with a PowerPoint, I can show you all sorts of images and other material that I can't show you in the gallery. So what I invite you to do is to like sit, you know, go on this journey with me today and then go back to the galleries or go to the galleries and experience the artworks um, there because the images I'm going to show you today are not going to be as beautiful and as powerful as the actual artworks, but I can talk to you a lot with a lot more uh, material um, today with the, with the PowerPoint. Um, the gallery presents work of black artists in the Americas who explored connections to the arts of Africa. The show is about how artists in the 20th century turn their gaze to the mother continent and through artistic traditions, aesthetic expressions, and religious practices, negotiated notions of identity and ancestral legacy and memory. Um, the um, exhibition is, uh, the theme is not a Boston theme, but I'll pinpoint throughout the lecture how we've really gone out and um, included Boston-based artists to make the show grounded here and specifically for Boston-based audiences. The importance of this exhibition is really that it centers a black art history, which has been omitted from the canon and sidelined from accounts of American art. And it shows how Africa's importance and cultural contributions are vital for our understanding of modern history, politics, and economics. So if you're coming up the stairs or taking the elevator and you go through the front doors of the third floor, this is what you'll see. You're going to be greeted by John Wilson's eternal presence. And I know Ethan Lasser talked to a lot about this um, work uh, last session, I think last week, um, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. It's a uh, permanent collection acquisition, recent acquisition, so it will stay with us for much longer than Touching Roots, which will rotate out in July. But um, just to draw your connections to how it relates to Touching Roots is that, as you will have heard from last week, uh, Wilson uh, draws on many different sources, uh, Boston's own uh, Buddha's Olmec heads from Mexico, as well as Yoruba sculptures uh, from West Africa, and particularly the idea of uh, exhibiting this facial, ex like um, what we might read as a blank facial expression was understood to be a symbol of spirituality and coolness uh, for Yoruba cultures. And so in that way, John Wilson was looking at African art when he was conceiving of this monumental artwork, and it connects to, to the themes of touching roots that we will explore uh, today. It additionally has this connecting through line because the uh, full sculpture, the full big sculpture, like six, more than six feet tall, is outside of the National Center for African American Art, which is in Roxbury, that was led, directed by Barry Gaither, this massive pivotal force in the Boston area for over 30 years, 40 years, and who curated exhibitions at the MFA on themes like Touching Roots. Um, he was, uh, we'll see, he was one of the first uh, um, curators to give Lois Melu Jones her f first retrospective here at the MFA in 1972. And importantly, in 1970, he curated the show African American Artists Boston and New York. And so what I'm showing you here is a, a picture of, of him. Oh, oh my goodness. 
Um, here's the pointer. This is what he looks like now, but this is what he looked like in 1970. This is at the MFA. These are our galleries. I don't know exactly where in the museum this was, but this was here. This was a, a picture from the show um, Afro-American Afro Artists, New York and Boston. And so to, to kind of say that there is a context for Touching Roots, it has a long history and a long legacy thanks to the work like people like Barry Gaither um, and so it's important to, to recognize um, that history. Um, and before I even want to you know, begin, I want to um, give thanks and mention and uh, bring into this room and into the space the work that uh, my curatorial collaborators did on this show, uh, Shanoa Baker, Stephen Hamilton, Napoleon Jones Henderson, and Kira Daniels. Um, the four of us uh, worked on the show, um, created the layout, talked about the themes, um, and really the, the show is, is thanks to them and their um, vision for it um, and how we uh, curated this together. And maybe after in the Q&A, I can go into how we work together to, to make this show, but um, you know they were really uh, key and pivotal. Um, so the first thing that you will see as an introduction in Touching Roots is uh, the centering of Lois Melu Jones. She was an artist that was born in Boston in 1905 to an upper middle class family, and she summered on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, she was the first black female graduate of the SMFA in 1927. So her formation um, is uh, here, has roots uh, to, uh, to the Bos lo local Boston area. She visited the MFA, like the MFA as an institution was f uh, foundational to her um, growth as, as, a, as an artist. And in 2006, we received um, a, a quite a large amount of her work. We're one of the, the biggest holders of her work. Um, in, in this area, so a lot of work is collected. She had a, a really wonderful career at Howard University, so in the DC area, um, that's uh, another place where she, a lot of her work um, still exists. But we're the only institution that can ground uh, her artistic trajectory around the African diaspora, beginning uh, here in Boston, but also in Paris, in um, Haiti, and then when she finally visits the African continent. This is a view you'll see as, uh, around the introduction to the show. And I will be first talking about these three paintings here, uh, Jean Martiniquez, um, Ubi Girl, and um, Haitian Voodoo, um, that are displayed, as you'll see, in a non-chronological order in the galleries to sort of make the point of whose journey is ever linear, whose journey is ever um, straightforward. She too had a meandering, a you know her, her own um, kind of way of developing an idea of who she it, it was as an artist. Um, in the um, this is a self-portrait of her in, in 1940. Um, and this is a kind of a tr uh, a, the, the three paintings on display um, of her work as, as we would meet them in her own chronology, as she made them in, in chronological order. Um, and uh, these three distinct paintings chart moments of, um, of, of major creative shifts in her thinking and in her artwork. So we start here with uh, the painting Jeanne Martiniquez. Um, she graduated, as I mentioned, from the SMFA in 1927, and a decade later she had a, a scholarship to, to go to Paris. Um, and there she uh, saw the, you know, she, she was a total sponge abs absorbing everything that she could, um, steeped in both modernism at the time, so she went to the Universal um, Exposition of 1937, she saw Picasso's Guernica, she also walked through the uh, colonial museums like the Trocadero or the Musée de l'Homme where in, um, on display were the 
um, stolen artworks um, from an African mission of 1932. So she was looking at African art placed in a colonial context, and at the same time, she was also involved in um, anti-colonial uh, circles known as the Negritude. She, wrote, she was writing a lot of letters to her mom, and this new book that's on your bibliography by Rebecca Van Diver um, charts a lot of this uh, research, um, uh, uh, primary research, archival research. But arriving in Paris, she said, noted that Africa was everywhere. It was a thing. All the galleries, museums were featuring African sculptures, African designs, and I sketched, I sketched everything. So she was a sponge absorbing and uh, taking in all uh, the influences that were available to her. Um, so while she was looking at artworks framed by the French powers, the colonial powers, she was also moving in these circles, and we know this because of Rebecca Van Diver's scholarship, who has um, identified this sitter. The title of the work is Jeanne Martiniquez, and um, Rebecca Van Diver saw in her mother's, in her letters to her mother, that she, quote, went with one of the graduates from the Sorbonne, Jeanne Zamir, from Martinique, now married to a doctor in Guadeloupe, who is visiting her sister, Mademoiselle Nardal, who is um, here to see a minister of the colonies. I am going to do a portrait of Jeanne. So who, who is this, this um, wonderful female sitter who we see um, with um, a turban and um, kind of very colorful attire, a, a beautiful brooch, um, uh, jewelry, this really intimate portrait um, of, this, of this woman. Um, in the 1930s, her and her sister had these salons where they hosted intellectuals, writers, um, uh, artists, um, anyone, and it was a kind of focal meeting point between uh, African Americans traveling to Paris and those of the uh, Americas traveling to Paris and from the African continent. So Paris was this nodal point. And these women, her Jeanne and her sister um, uh, Paulette, were creating the environment for these dialogues uh, to happen. Um, the, so to give you a broader umbrella, what was like the negritude movement, it was a political and literary endeavor initiated as a rejection of French colonial racism by um, a poet, Aimé César, uh, the poet Léon Damas, and the um, uh, theorist Léopold Sangor um, from Senegal, who were adopting a, and embracing the idea of racial black solidarity. So negritude as a word can be translated as black, blackness in French, and the movement is based in the 1920s, um, uh, you know, and, and as Paris uh, featured this um, focal point. Um, so here we have these, uh, these sisters, the Nadal sisters. Can you believe it? There were seven of them um, from Martinique, and they came uh, to Paris, each one in, you know, in their early adult life. Um, they were um, educated under the French colonial system and had access to Paris, but were um, teaching themselves about how to um, dismantle this oppressive um, context. Um, so um, together with her sister Paulette, um, Jean was... Um, uh, who was the first black French uh, journalist in Paris. Jeanne hosted these uh, multicultural salons and out of which this uh, magazine, uh, La Revue du Monde Noir, the journal of the black world, um, kind of emerged out of this. Jeanne published a couple of essays and um, poems in there. I love uh, the description. So here is Jeanne Nadel, a picture I found from her from 1925, 
sure Lois Mary Jones's portrait from 38 is a little later, but we get a sense of who she is. Um, she was described as the free spirit of her family. She'd wear jangling bracelets all up her arms or an earring in one ear, but not the other. She painted her fingernails in all different colors. Um, everyone who mentions Jeanne comments on her uniqueness. She took pride in her African heritage and often wear African jewelry and turbans. So we definitely see that um, in Lois's, uh, Lois Jones's portrait. And sometimes she used, used the pseudonym Yadhe, who um, her niece believes is the name after African woman or spirit. So she was, out of all of the sisters, the one that most connected with this idea of pan-African thought or, or, or connecting with her African um, roots. Jeanne went to Paris to study literature and French from 1923 to 1928. And, um, it, you know, in 1929, back, back so the, she was crisscrossing the Atlantic. Um, she hosted in Martinique um, a conference on, uh, you know, the blackness of uh, in, in the United States. And so we can see how Lois Jones was, um, had connected an affinity with this uh, wonderful woman who was worldly, um, was somewhat eccentric in the best possible ways, and was someone who um, Lois Mary Jones probably looked up to and was thinking about as some, someone who she wanted to um, relate to. And so we have this beautiful portrait of her um, in the galleries. It's very intimate. Um, she's not looking at the viewer directly, but sort of slightly off to the side in a very thoughtful gaze. But we are, we're close up to her, um, getting a sense of the proximity that Lois Melu Jones was, was striving at in, in um, her relationship with uh, Jean Nadal. We also notice at this time, uh, Lois Mary Jones was painting in a very kind of Western realist style. Um, and so we, this comes across in this portrait. It's, it's a frontal portrait. Um, but I, th I think there's something very unique about the striation here in the background of the different colors of uh, browns, for example. Um, maybe a nod to some Pan-African thought of unity of blackness across the globe, I don't know, open to interpretation, but something that isn't, um, is, is abstract-like. Uh, um, fast forward, so Lois Mary Jones comes back to the United States, she starts teaching at Howard, um, she has many other opportunities to travel, um, and in the 1950s into 60s, she starts traveling to Haiti. Um, to uh, she, her first trip is in 1954 as part of an artistic commission um, for to promote Haitian tourism. Uh, to put Haiti in context for African Americans at this time, you know the country ha was a huge port for um, the Atlantic slave trade, but Haiti was one of those countries in. Um, in the Caribbean who had had um, a revolution, the 1791-1804 rev slave rebellion that resulted in the first and only black-led government and this record of the nation's independence. And so for African Americans, Haiti had this lore of um, uh, you know, success story. Um, she also, Lois Jones also married a Haitian uh, graphic designer, Louis-Pierre Noel, in the south of France, and so she, uh, who, who she'd met and married in the south of France, and so visiting Haiti was also a way to spend time, and she sort of spent her time between Washington and Haiti through the 50s and 60s. While she was there, she became incredibly um, interested in the syncretic religion of Haitian voodoo, um, which comes from West and Central Africa. And again, this moment of study, of encounter, prompts her to have a shift in her artistic practice. Um, here, this is a, um, a, an image of a, a ceremony, so um, that she was participating in and attending, 
priests and priestesses draw these um, shapes on the ground. They are um, spirits, um, all called veve. They are invoked during the ceremony and um, are meant to be uh, kind of effaced throughout the ceremony. They're ephemeral. They're not supposed to be long-lasting. Um, and so she draw, draws this painting, um, Veve Voodoo number two, she starts to uh, number her work, um, has these r quite radical shifts. So instead of a frontal perspective, what we're seeing in Lois Mary Jones is a bird's eye view of the sacred space drawn by priests and priests. It might seem simple, but this shift of perspective is very um, indicative of a complete change of framework. Um, Western canon is so tied to a frontal form of perspectival um, rendition, and a bird's eye view is a completely different way of thinking, and it flattens the space. Um, and she starts to incorporate these veve um, that she's seeing priests and priestesses draw. And more importantly, she starts to include um, ephemeral material. There's this painting, if you see it in the gallery in person, um, these are paper collaged elements that she adheres to the surface. And so this idea of ephemerality that she's witnessing in these ceremonial spaces seep into her way of making and she starts to include these ephemeral uh, materials. Um, and the last work of this introductory period, and I know I've spent a lot of time on Lois Mary Jones, we could have a whole lecture on her, um, but she, she um, pulls out um, important themes that we'll return to today that are throughout the exhibition. Um, in the 1970s, she takes uh, many different trips to the African continent. She visits in 1970, 72, 76, and 77. And she visits many countries, the Congo, Congo Benin, Ethiopia, Ghana, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Libya. She really um, travels a tremendous amount. Her uh, work there in, in her trips is of cultural exchange. She brings with her artworks of artists that she knows, uh, her contemporaries to share with artists that she is planning on meeting there. And so it's one of, of learning, um, a trip of, of, of shared knowledge, of bridging the gap between across the Atlantic. And uh, this is one of the um, main paintings that we're lucky to have, an icon of the MFA's collection called Ubi Girl. And it illustrates how her trips uh, transformed her work, how she is integrating this idea of kind of collage, but rather through ephemeral materials, it's more uh, compositionally. She um, creates these elements um, of collage. Um, and here, it's sort of like um, a virtual tour of Africa that we see consolidated in this trip. Um, she uh, includes uh, a, uh, a young girl uh, from the Ubi tribe in the Cote d'Ivoire here in the central, and her face is painted as part of an initiation ceremony. But then she's also including uh, different art artworks, artifacts um, from the continent that she's um, meet, uh, encountering. Um, so um, the Pende masks are here um, from the, um, here's an example of one from the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is one of our collection, um, a Dan mask. Um, you know, 20th century, these are her contemporaries. These aren't artworks from centuries ago. These are artworks that were made at the same time as Lois Mary Jones was, was working. And her painting is one of integration. One of the uh, arguments that Rebecca Van Diver makes in her book, uh, Designing a New Tradition, is that um, the, the, this Ubi girl invokes this idea of multiplicity in blackness, or blackness in triplicate, um, and that the collage effect is really one of um, connection um, that she's making. For Jones, she devised at this time after these trips and after she journeyed through the African diaspora, this idea of blackness as being both 
a physical location and a shared experience embodied by references to the Atlantic slave trade. Blackness is also a reference to um, the physical and aesthetic, ancient and classical, signified by African cultural objects. And third, blackness is human and modern. And though all these ideas are coalescing together, coming together um, in paintings like uh, Ubi Girl, where she grounds herself and her, her art becomes bigger, bolder, confident, and it's, she finds her voice as an artist and as a black female uh, woman. So the themes that we're discussing here are uh, connections to, um, to roots, uh, connections to Africa, how spirituality and religion and um, connection to um, a kind of way of knowing um, form this, uh, this glue that um, connects um, the, the continents across the African diaspora. To understand Jones's journey, um, we have to sort of take a step back to the beginning of the 20th century and think about theorists like um, Elaine Leroy Locke, for example, and put you in context with the New Negro Movement and the Harlem Renaissance. These are all movements that really got underway at the end of uh, the uh, 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century. You had radicals like W.E.B. Du Bois advocating for uh, 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 black solidarity around the, um, around the globe um, of a progressive um, kind of uh, self um, determination and self-actualization for um, black people. And so the new Negro movement was this concept where, um, you know, the, uh, the blacks needed to harness this idea of uh, defining who themselves, their own culture and who they are and their um, ancestral legacy. Importantly for the visual arts and what's called the Harlem Renaissance, which is like an arm of the uh, New Negro movement, um, Locke wrote this essay in 1925 called The Legacy of uh, the Ancestral Arts. Ancestral arts is both past but also contemporary, present. And his idea was that um, African Americans needed to develop a distinctly uh, own visual language, and he was remarking how Europeans were looking to African arts for inspiration, and he was noting that their engagement in African art was one of um, su surface, that Picasso, Braque, um, and others were looking at form to get away from the Western canon, and he was making an argument that it has a whole, a totally different political significance if African American artists look to the arts of Africa, because that allows them to uh, recenter and decolonize their artwork. And what was at stake for them, he uh, urged them to think about, was to create a self-consciously liberated visual language. And so he was talking to um, the artists at the time, like Aaron Douglas, um, Hale Woodruff, um, and here I'm showing you Sergeant Claude Johnson, to, to look at the arts of Africa in, in their work. Um, it wasn't just a New York City Bay, even though Harlem was a center, Sergeant Johnson, for example, was um, based in San Francisco. So these ideas, really spread um, and quite quickly. And so it's interesting to see how, um, how wide and broad the, the, these ideas um, traveled. Um, Sergeant uh, Claude Johnson um, created a series of sculptures in the mid thirties like this one, uh, ma simply titled Mask. Um, out of copper, and I think this is, and we have this, this is in our collection, I think it's one of the most important series or uh, period of work um, by him, where he was really combining a modern Descartes aesthetic with um, what he was learning uh, through photography and books 
uh, about African masks and their function in um, performances, but a lot of it was decontextualized. Um, a lot of the material that traveled in the United States was devoid, mostly devoid of its cultural context, so it was looking at uh, the form, but engaging in this form very profoundly. And um, this is a quote by him from um, 1935, one of the only kind of declarations we have of the goal of his work, and it's, it is the pure ne American Negro that I'm concerned with. I wish to show that beauty is not so much to the white man as to the Negro himself. And he was, you know, promoting and connecting this work, connecting with African um, masks, but also taking that visual language and inventing it into something else, into a kind of uh, a syncretization mix between sort of art deco, modern aesthetic. Um, so it wasn't a, a mere copying, it was a translation of um, what he might have been uh, looking at. And he says this is for, it's for black people, it's for, how, you know, to, to give them a sense of what the ne new Negro uh, person, idea, identity might be. In the same case um, that we have the Sergeant Johnson mask is um, James Richmond Barthé. This case is loosely called Africa in the Imagination because none of these artists had the opportunity in the 1920s and 30s to travel to Africa. And so what they knew were th through, through books uh, and photography. Um, unlike you in Europe where there were uh, huge quantities of African art in colonial museums. America was relatively um, short of actual artwork. There was a Barnes collection in Philadelphia, but beyond that, there weren't uh, that many artworks that traveled that artists were, had access to. And so, for example, this book, Carl Einstein's Afrikanische Plastique, was a seminal way in which um, artworks um, traveled and artists had access uh, to them. And here um, in James uh, Barthé's African Woman, we know, for example, that he was looking at um, thing, f uh, images that were circulating, like this one by George Specht from 1925, of um, the wife of a Mangbaktu chief, Tuba, named Nomosodru. And this, uh, this image circulated widely. It was taken from the side. It was showing how the Mangbaktu people were well known for their practice of limpombo, which is to um, the sort of beauty and the elongation of the head to denote status and majesty and also accentuated by kind of these basket weave hairstyles. And we can see how Barthé took uh, this, this, this photograph, was inspired by this image, but really focused on the frontal view rather than kind of from the side, rather than the ethnographic view. And the hairstyle becomes almost like a halo, and he's emphasizing her um, the softness of her features, um, thinking he was also inspired by the Renaissance and the classicization. And so he's uh, moving away from an ethnographic portrayal to one of, of beauty and, and classicism. Contrary to Africa in the imagination and when artists were looking um, to understand um, African art in an intellectual way, in a way that is very much uh, knowledge-seeking, um, the exhibition Touching Roots also highlights a different way of knowing, of making, that has been passed down through generations um, in um, different communities and whose roots we can trace back. And this is knowledge of making art that is um, unconscious, less, less sort of, uh, sort of, innate um, in a way that um, has, has been passed down through mother-daughter relationships. So for example, on uh, the left, the right here, I'm showing you um, a G's Bend quilt by the artist Annie Mae Young, 
who was taking uh, ideas from uh, kente cloth and strip weaving, which dates back to the 10th century. So this is an old way of making um, that um, she is, is connected with, that w the knowledge came over through um, the transatlantic slave trade, and then artists continued to make uh, works with the same aesthetic. Um, so strip weaving comes from the Mande people, and I'm showing you here a woman's wrapper of kente cloth um, in our collection from the 20th century. And um, what was, what's interesting is that these are strips of woven material that are then sewn together. And um, what is kind of prized or um, the aesthetic that is um, sought for is these asymmetrical, unpredictable patterns, the aesthetic of offbeat designs. And you can see that kind of same rhythmicality in Annie Mae Young's um, blocks and strips. She didn't weave this cloth, it's um, denim, mostly denim, which has a kind of uh, civil rights movement um, overtones and black power movement overtones. But there is a kind of um, rhythmicality to the uh, composition and the strips that have been um, arranged for this quilt that echo some, you know, as echo um, the composition of this um, kente wrapper. And then I can't help but think that some of these colors are intentional, these high contrasts between blue and red. Um, they're aesthetically pleasing to the eye, but in Yoruba culture, for example, white is identified with the god um, Ob Obtalata, which represents character, pure intentions, and source of knowledge. Red is associated with Shango, the god of thunder, and is a symbol of Ashe, the power to make things happen and to make things multiply. Blue symbolizes coolness, composure, calculated thought, control, and generosity. And, you know, these colors are, are all in Annie Mae Young's um, quilt. So maybe that's something she was less conscious of, I don't know, but, um, you know, they're, they're very present and powerful. And likewise, um, Mary Jackson, um, she's from South Carolina, a descendant of the Gullah community who uh, came from West Africa and maintained a very strong sense of identity um, in, in the United States all these um, centuries. And um, the idea of um, crafting these baskets uh, with uh, sweet grass. Um, so traditionally, men gathered bulrush from the area's wetlands and created large utilitarian baskets for storing rice. And women specialized in domestic forms, such as decorative baskets and basket made for food and clothing. And this um, uh, basket weave tradition is considered one of the oldest African-American crafts linked directly to African roots. Um, um, and, and so there is this very direct um, lineage. Mary Jackson talks about having learned this from her grandmother and mother, both lifelong basket weavers before her. And so these traditions are one that she grew up with, that she knew intimately, to have a sense of home to her, even though um, you know, she's descended from displaced people, it has um, something familiar that um, I think, if we think back to our own, you know, things that we learn from our own parents that are cultural traditions that somehow teach us about um, who, who we are. And in the same sort of space is an artist like Stephen Hamilton, who also looks at these traditions, African-derived traditions, like indigo dyeing and um, strip weaving. Um, but he went to Nigeria to, to, to learn um, from, um, from these masters. Um, this is a work um, from 2018 from a series uh, that he made called The Founders Project, where he worked with then high school students and I um, often, I have to catch myself, it's five years ago, they've all graduated now, but these um, high school students posed for him 
um, as leaders of African the con continent's history. Um, so this is Deshaun Borden, is a Boston contemporary, um, now graduated high school student as Sundiata Keita, um, the first emperor of the Mali Empire. And I give you a sense of the kind of geography of um, the Mali Emp Empire as it came to be um, in the tw um, uh, between uh, 1200 CE to uh, 1250 um, CE. Um, he was a ruler that we should all know about, just like we know like of Charlemagne and other kind of um, in Western uh, history, like the medieval period. Um, his name means Lion Prince, and he was um, bo born to this noble family, um, and he um, connected uh, different uh, cultures and groups. Uh, there are oral histories of him. Uh, he was known to have been a sickly child who suffered um, sort of uh, physical um, ailments, slow to walk, um, slow to sort of develop. And for a while, he used to uh, walk and run with an iron crutch, which later became his, um, his bow. Um, and his, he was then grew to being a, a warrior, a, a powerful warrior, using his bow, uh, his crutch as a bow. So the symbolism there between, um, you know, the thing that helps support you then becomes your greatest sort of um, uh, weapon or your, your great, greatest asset. Um, another, you know, greatest accomplishment um, in the Mali Empire, he's known to have write it, written the first charter of human rights. Um, so when we think about his accomplishments, we're really talking about a global, you know, global history, something we should all know about. And, um, you know, Stephen's, uh, the, the power of Stephen's project is to put contemporary um, individuals in the shoes as, to represent them as these great leaders that um, you know, have been marginalized, have been purposefully oppressed from kind of our um, global uh, sense of, of uh, global history and knowledge. Um, I can talk at length about Stephen's work. He is so incredibly skilled. He um, weaves his own cloth um, and then he paints on it. So when I describe his process, he really begins with, with nothing. He begins with the raw materials. It's just not like he buys canvas and, um, and, and creates um, his work and his mastery both as a textile artist and um, as a painter. Um, the, the, the central space of the gallery, and here I'm showing you an image of what you'd see if you would turn from um, the intro wall and look at the main space, which has purposely been um, curated as being very open, so you can make connections between artworks um, incredibly easy. It makes it for a, tour, a difficult tour because there's no one trajectory or one pathway. But an overwhelming um, theme is this idea of ancestral spirits. Um, and um, there's this wonderful quote by um, Ariana Brown, if you're alive, you are descended from people who refuse to die. Nothing is more sacred than you. And this idea, we talked at length with the group about ancestral spirits, and should it be religion with a capital R, but it shouldn't because spirits has this inclusive quality to the term, um, and that the connection of of those belief systems that make culture that um, cannot be um, severed are the things that connect um, every, you know, those across the um, African diaspora. And so um, the, you know, it, it, the whole um, show is about how the ancestors are always with us and their way of understanding the world impact who we are today and who uh, we want to be into the future. Um, spirituality features really prominently in this collection, these three works that I will um, give you a little bit more detail on today. 
Um, Hale Woodruff, for example, at the top right, and here we see him in the galleries. Um, this painting is called a Shanti image, and we've shown this painting before in the context of American modernism and American abstraction. Hale Woodruff uh, was based at a teacher at Clark uh, University in Atlanta, and um, he's most well known, he's well known for this set of murals that represent a global narrative of cultural history of Africans in the Americas. So he's very in touch with this idea of um, ancestral lineage in, in the Americas. And so this painting, Ashanti image, um, which predates that work um, by a few years, shows um, him uh, uh, thinking about different ways of um, uh, um, playing with uh, a form and color and flattening an image, but the shapes, though, relate to uh, these Ashanti weights um, from um, the Ashanti kingdom of present-day Ghana. And in the galleries, you'll see... Uh, oh, I keep doing that. Here, uh, we uh, brought up Four, we have a collection of about 200 Ashanti weights. These are weights that are made out of bronze and were used um, to, um, in the scales to counterweight gold dust, which was the economy um, of the Ashanti kingdom. This is something that most people will have had um, in, you know, kind of on their persons if they were. Um, engaged in some sort of transaction, they would have had their own personalized weight, which would, they would have used on their scales. But these weights weren't just some, the most kind of old ones were like discs, but they quickly morphed into um, different shapes unto their own. Think about the currency that you may not carry around because now we're all on credit cards, but you know there, there are images on our own bills, on our coins. Um, these were sort of like coins in three-dimensional form, and instead of people, they had animals or objects that related to proverbs that had value systems, just like George Washington has a value for us today. And um, these gold, uh, well, bronze weights of measured gold dust. So some of we have here a collection of um, this bird, um, this uh, seated stool, this double-headed axe, and a little antelope. Um, forms that you can, in the gallery, see the connection with in the forms that Hale Woodruff um, painted. And he had some in his own collection. So we know that he was relating uh, this painting to a, um, a source that was one of thinking about, um, you know, kind of the value systems of, of a better life, to be a better person. Um, he said, quote, the universality of art is the main thing. Understanding the African objects, like those of the Greeks, carried a deep and personal resonance and widespread widespread significance. So in the galleries, I invite you to have a close looking between the painting and uh, the objects. Um, I'm going to go a little bit quicker um, here. In the central space of the gallery is a collection of these two artworks that are separated between time and geography, uh, except for they fit so neatly into the theme of tombstone artwork. Um, we're seeing closest to us is uh, the artwork by Willis Bing Davis. He's uh, a contemporary artist based in Ohio. And behind him, um, you can see it better here, is a wooden sculpture by the Afro-Brazilian artist called Agnaldo dos Santos. And um, he was based um, near Bahia in the 1960s. So these two artists are separated, one in sort of North America and one in South America. They're working in two different time moments as well, both looking at connecting with um, traditions of um, uh, kind of ancestral art. So Willis Bing Davis, for example, is looking at the African-American tradition 
of uh, memory vessels and embedding uh, our elements that of personal memory into ceramics. Um, and his piece is much bigger. It sort of relates a little bit to the um, Edgefield show um, in Torf that just opened. But this piece um, is much bigger and he's uh, engraved um, different elements from kente cloth designs um, to sort of markings and um, other things that evoke um, African um, uh, kind of designs. Uh, meanwhile, Agnaldo Santos is looking at the Congolese um, Natidi sculpture, which um, is, this is an example in our collection. Don't worry about the male-female um, gendering, which can be misleading, but it's more about the posture, the crossed legs and the crossed arms that you see repeated um, here. And this crossing is one of um, groundedness and leadership and thoughtful, um, you know, thoughtfulness uh, meant to uh, pay reverence to the, the deceased. So Agnaldo Sosantos was looking at sculptures like this that were making their way to Brazil through uh, the trade routes, um, but he was also looking at how the Congolese were making caricatures of their Portuguese colonizers by including a pipe and a bowler hat. And so uh, Agnaldo Sosantos sort of triangulates these two um, uh, types of sculptures in, in one work, and he kind of um, collages them together, another kind of theme back to um, Lois um, Melu Jones. And then we have a contemporary artist like uh, Napoleon Jones Henderson. This is um, Tricky Slicky, um, which is next to, um, you know, in adjacent proximity. Uh, he also went to Haiti in the 1990s, um, uh, so a connection to Lois uh, May Lou Jones. And he too is, is, is working at the intersection of textiles, African textiles and strip weaving, um, as well as integrating the bright colors of um, the, uh, he was one of the founding members of the Afri-Cobra movement that was founded in Chicago. And he came to uh, the Boston um, area in 1974 to teach at Mass Art. Um, coming here, he found this thread that has this um, sh uh, metallicness to it, which he relates to uh, shine theory, which is the aesthetic principle which emphasizes positive images of black people, quality of luminosity, unity, and collective affirmation of black culture. He started this work and wove up to here, already having created the overall design and composition for the work, and then went to Haiti, and he'll tell you the funniest story about um, the way that this piece was interrupted, because he went to help uh, them uh, train uh, in um, a textile and um, fabric dyeing to make uh, objects for, for trade. Um, and he'll tell you that when he worked with these women, the, uh, the dye wasn't sticking to the fabric because they weren't putting the salt in the baths but keeping it for themselves to, to cook. Um, and he was like, I, you know, um, told the supervisor to not come in the second day and told the women, look, I understand that you're keeping some of the salt for yourself, but you have to put some in the bath so that the, the process works. His way of telling it is so much more funny than, than, than what I did. But um, the point is, though, that the, the exchange, him, just like Jones traveled to Haiti and was influenced by Haitian voodoo, um, uh, Napoleon came back to Boston after having this trip and spoken to these women who were making uh, both dyeing fabrics but uh, decorating um, uh, pillows and quilts with applique, so stitching um, uh, designs and sewing them directly onto the fabric, that he too came back and finished this piece using the applique method. So an idea of like cross-cultural exchange that is so integral to the African diaspora. And 
um, the um, the applique um, technique has this uh, tradition too of um, of being uh, one that in African continents used for storytelling um, in fabric design. So it's not just for decoration. It has um, a kind of a deeper significance of storytelling, which is what this uh, work is all about. It's the elephant mask um, used in the Cameroon, um, meant uh, for uh, masquerades and performances, ceremonial occasions, major festivals, and uh, funerals. So it's one of cultural connectivity, of coming together, of oral history. Um, and so, you know, how he then goes to Haiti to tap into something that has deep roots um, in, the, in the African continent. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go a little quicker. I know I'm sort of, uh, I've got uh, 15 or so minutes left. Um, so we've looked at the 1920s and 30s movement of the New Negro, the Harlem Renaissance, um, and important to linger on another moment um, of the 1960s and 70s here in the United States. Uh, we were yeah, steeped in the civil rights movement, um, and at the same time, um, leaders of the civil rights movement were looking to the African continent, how many countries were um, you know, self-emancipating, um, shaking off colonial rule, and becoming self-governing. And so it prompted another wave of um, interest in the African continent. And after the Second World War, the ability to travel became such, uh, uh, so much easier. And so we have artists like Jones traveling for the first time, uh, Coffee Bailey and Ruben Valentin, two artists I'm showing here, travel to the African continent. Perhaps Alan Rohan Kreit, uh, I'm not entirely sure. But this face-to-face, uh, -face, and we've all missed that during the pandemic, what it means to be there physically, what it means to be there in person has a completely different effect than um, if you're just sort of, uh, you know, doing uh, that kind of connected work long distance. Um, one of the big kind of uh, opportunities for um, this connectivity were these two major exhibitions. You think of like the Venice Biennale as being like this hub of artists all over the world coming together. So in 1966, there was the first World Festival of Negro Arts in Dakar, in Senegal. Um, organized by the uh, Negritude uh, uh, poet and thinker, Leopold Senghor, for example. So his work, the seeds that he'd planted in the 20s and 30s kind of bore fruits or bore kind of actual impact, um, broad impact, uh, worldwide impact, I'd say, in the 1960s. And then in 1977, there was a second um, festival in, um, in Nigeria. And so these uh, moments, it was uh, almost uh, a few weeks of coming together, um, uh, countries had delegates, um, they brought, you know, kind of like the Venice Biennale, you had um, artists from all over the world coming and to exhibit and to, um, and to share and uh, commune together. So in, in the galleries, this is an uh, older installation, we have this grouping um, of Pan-Africanism pulled together by the colors of the Pan-African flag, which are black, red, and green, um, giving coherence to this um, small installation. Um, one of the works you'll see up now is um, Ruth Waddy's uh, Boy with the Globe. It's such a tender image of a young boy looking at the world and finding Africa and finding a place, um, you know, finding what it looks like geographically on the world, on the globe. Um, and he's somewhere in a intellectual setting, either a library or a school library with the books behind him. And so this idea of coming to know um, your place, your relationship to where um, Africa is on the globe. As well as um, Alan Rohan Kreit and these two artworks that are on display in the galleries where he's placing side by side 
um, contemporary Bos then contemporary Bostonians. He had been painting um, local people of the neighborhood of Roxbury and the South Boston since the 1930s. In the 70s, he starts a suite where he is um, painting, uh, drawing them, but next to, facing, side by side, uh, well-known African artworks. Um, this might be the Benin Queen in the British Museum, for example, that he was looking at uh, through um, uh, magazines or photography, for example. Um, this is sort of has uh, echoes to what then we saw Stephen Hamilton do in 2018, this idea of connecting local contemporary people with um, you know, figures either from the past or artworks from uh, another time, putting them face to face, saying collapsing time and space, saying that the, the differences aren't so huge, um, that there are similarities that you can uh, see in connecting them. Um, Coffee Bailey um, is was a Chicago-based artist. He came through Boston in the 1970s. Um, Barry Gaither remembers meeting him. Um, he traveled, he died relatively young, but he traveled, um, uh, it, it, he went to Europe, and then he was at the 1966 um, festival, uh, first world festival of Negro art. So, um, someone who, who, who traveled to the African continent and who, who went to this uh, meeting um, and then came back and uh, came back to the United States and painted this um, portrait of George Jackson, the equal rights activist, um, hugely well known at this time and who had um, just been uh, shot. He uh, spent most of his uh, adult young adult life um, imprisoned for a petty crime and the incarceral system is a huge other topic that we have to have time to go into today. Um, but he, he spent most of his time in, imprisoned and uh, was an activist from there, a little bit like Antonio Gramsci, um, and um, became an incredibly popular icon and civil rights activist in his own time. Um, and then was um, shot as uh, in a prison escape attempt um, or murdered. Um, and this beautiful painting by Coffee Bailey um, has um, similarities, I think, with uh, um, Lois Melu Jones, Jean Martiniquez, this very uh, intimate portrait of a figure who you have um, feel some sort of relationship with um, and connection with um, memorializing um, his um, you know his contributions to um, the um, the black uh, arts movement um, also at the world festival in 1966 is another artist who comes from a co totally different um, geographic origin. Ruben Valentin is another Afro-Brazilian artist who uh, was working in uh, Bahia and then Sao Paulo. Um, he um, was very much in touch with uh, the West African traditions, uh, like religion that has melded and shifted and changed in Brazil called Candomblé with um, spirits from the Yoruba tradition. And um, in uh, and 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 integrating them into his work at a moment when they were still regarded as sort of folk um, and um, marginalized by mainstream uh, kind of cultural thinking in Brazil. Um, and it's only when he uh, travels. Um, in 1962 and 63 to Europe, he's based in Rome. Um, he goes to the British Museum and he looks at, again, artworks from Africa from this colonial perspective. Does he see um, and start to really um, paint um, figuratively um, uh, art, you know, kind of the, the spirits um, of the candomblé? Um, so, for example, the, uh, uh, at the left, the long red column evokes the staff of the spirit 
uh, oxala, uh, the sky and universe. Um, and then in the bottom right, you have the double X of the Shango here, um, the spirit of thunder and fire. He says, my thought has always been the result of an awareness for the people and the land. He declared in his 1976 manifesto. Um, and, you know, he's really thinking about um, connecting the um, context in which he was uh, grown and, um, and and was incredibly familiar, but then when he sees it from another perspective, does he really start to integrate it into his work? In our last section, Behind the Wall, there's a big surprise, and you'll see here, um, this is the view you have in the gallery, is Brian McFarlane's huge um, painting. Um, and this last sort of section focuses on dance and how dance is a major form of cultural expression and it is embodied and it, it you know that you practice it and you teach it by reenacting it each time so the power of dance is huge in throughout the african uh, diaspora and it's one that you don't need anything <laughs> You know, you don't need any more tools, you don't need paints or canvases. It's something that lives really intimately inside, inside you. Um, so Brian McFarlane uh, is a Jamaican artist and he went to um, Ghana in the 1980s, late 1980s, and participated in a spiritual dance for the uh, Orisha, the spirit of water, Yamaha, and painted her here, kind of coming out of this platform that's based off of, this is actual kente cloth in the gallery, so you can see this beautiful platform where she's rising up and um, there's a swirl of water and different masks that um, he has um, created out of his own imagination this painting is beautifully rewarding to look at, and every time you'll see it, you'll find something new um, to, to see um, in it. And I'm going to end with Jones again, and so we sort of come full circle um, at the end of this show, returning back to Lois Mary Jones, a painting she made in 1974 of Josephine Baker, whom she saw perform in the 1930s while she was in Paris. And again, she wrote to her mom, I saw Josephine Baker perform, this beautiful dancer who was bold and confident and had um, understood sort of who she was and had a tremendous amount of agency on stage, almost with dreamy eyes, like I want, almost like I want to be like her growing up or when I'm older but in an analogous way as a painter, as an artist, as, another, as, as an artist practicing in another medium. Um, when Josephine Baker passes away in 1977, Lois Mary Jones paints this picture. This is after she had had her own journey going to the African continent, visiting Haiti, had devised and figured out who she was as an artist. And so this painting, I can't but help but read it as a um, tribute to her, a memorial to her, and almost as two artists having uh, a peer-to-peer -peer dialogue um, of honoring uh, Josephine Baker and her accomplishments, um, but in, a, in the voice that um, once Lois Mary Jones had found her own voice. All right. I'm going to put um, this qu uh, poem up. Uh, it's a beautiful poem by the um, Harlem Renaissance poet, um, County Cullen, uh, What is Africa to Me? And I will also be available for any questions. Yes. Yeah, we can go back quickly. Um, I had to skip a few things uh, for time, but we have a few minutes left, so we can go back 
and talk about it. Um, this is here um, in the galleries. It's opposite uh, Jean Martiniquez. Uh, we Fredo Lam's a Cuban artist who traveled between Paris and the Americas and uh, one who uh, was participating in the negritude movement uh, circles and theories as well as the Parisian avant-garde movements. Um, so he was connected with the Surrealists, for example, um, who had a pretty international reach. Um, the show at the Met um, Beyond Surrealism, that catalog really charts how international the movement became and how invested also it was in um, decentering Paris and broadening it, the networks and um, channeling like decolonial conversations. Um, but he was invested in representing the um, uh, spirits of the Santeria, which is a bit like Condomble, these Yoruba-inspired um, mixing of, um, of religion, re religious spirits um, into his work. Um, he said as early as 1980, like, my painting is about decolonization. So he is using uh, the tools of Western painting, canvas, oils, but the, the subject matter that he represents are these, these, these um, Santeria spirits. Um, and so you see sort of animals morph, um, tails, um, double-headed um, double, um, axes, um, eyes, and in a way, different um, motifs that you can also see a little bit in Hale Woodruff's um, painting. Um, so these uh, forms and shapes and these spirits are called different things, but they really kind of encompass the African diaspora and traveled the African diaspora. There was a translatability to these spiritual um, uh, forms, like thunder and I, that are you know, that you find repeated slightly differently, but you find them across the African diaspora. Yes? Um, what informs your decision to use the word Negro, Negritude, Black, and African? I think it was sprinkled through your lecture, and I'm wondering, some of these words don't seem like you should use them now. Um, I try and be historic, um, and so if it's you know the the festival first world festival of Negro arts like that's what it was called. So I try and be historic. Negritude to its movement and its na name comes from the 1920s, um, and these are terms of um, self empowerment that um, these black individuals used, and um, I think to honor their um, Historicism is is the way that I I use them as uh, you know to connect them to their historical moment. Oh, thank you for the lecture. It's not a question, but I thought I might share um, uh, an experience from 1956 in connection with the sweetgrass baskets. Yeah. I took a bus trip from Michigan to South Carolina, and the the number of women by the side of the road selling those sweet baskets showed just what an intense, um, long-standing tradition it was. And you know, it was certainly to totally active. It was their subsistence, um, you know, means of subsistence at that time. But she was especially good at it. She I was, think. yeah. They were much simpler. You could buy them, and yeah. they were you know, things you'd take home. But, yeah. And they also had another experience not so long ago, but the first time the Gies Bend um, quilts were shown at the Corcoran in Washington, I got to sit at a table with the ladies. And the lady I spoke with, she said, I, I want to make it good because so many people will see it. And she had this lovely, lovely accent from the, the language that they speak there. But it's a treasured memory. <laughs> yes. yeah. And there also is a film where the women talk about the fabric and how they just had so much of that denim because that was, and they were making them to keep warm and just you know, reusing things. And then they, 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 I think it's in that same film, 
where they uh, are also quite excited when they get some printed fabrics that, you know, modern fabrics uh, besides the denim and some color. But what they did with them, of course, is, is and I loved your interpretation of it. I think that's right. I have a lot of African textiles and Thank you. you can see that. Thank you. Thank you. I was just wondering um, sort of the approach to looking at this type of thing and how, um, I guess my question is directly, are there black or African or, you know, artists in these time periods who painted nothing which referred to their ancestries who were successful and interesting as well, and wouldn't that be also a representation of that? I was wondering how the, you know. Yeah, sure. I mean, Sam Gilliam, for example, is an artist from the 60s and 70s making these large, like, fabric um, ca sculptural canvases. I mean, there's plenty of, of black artists working in many different ways. This is just a theme um, that is consistent throughout the specifically the 20 and 21st century. Um, so, I mean, black artists making lo loads of different types of work. This is just a very much more focused one um, and of, of how um, important this theme is for their you know, notions of self-identity, self-determination. Um, it also is a powerful theme in terms of us having this exhibition here is like um, restitution and, um, and and bringing in this thematic into the MFA and and, ma and centralizing it, making it so um, you know giving it such prominence, so that um, you know African history is world history, just like you know any other culture, and uh, but has been marginalized, oppressed, and 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 not. Um, and underrepresented, so put a cent putting a center on it is, is just really important. I hope this question isn't too impertinent. Some of us inevitably approach uh, African American art and the African diaspora from the outside. Um, and I wonder if I can ask you how you negotiate that uh, place that you are in relation to this art that you're talking about. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, yes, I negotiate it from the outside. I can connect to it because we can all connect to this idea of culture and our own cultural heritage and we all come from somewhere. So this idea of highlighting cultural legacy and cultural connection. Um, and, um, you know, I, 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 my role is really to uh, give space and to learn and to understand there's so much like beauty in these forms of connectivity and translation um, and, um, and to really celebrate it and give space to it. Um, you know, we, we see so much of a Western cultural heritage um, to give space to this other non-Western, like, for me, it's really refreshing and exciting and um, and beautiful. And there's so much to learn that you know I'm, I'm I and fundamentally though what um, what you you know what the what comes out of the space that any human being can connect to is. Uh, the kind of love and celebration of the joy of, of, of connectivity. And so even as a non-black person being in the space, it gives me a lot of joy to be in the galleries and to feel that sense of grandness, rootedness, and um, yeah, and, and joy in creating connection. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ibi. Um, my dad's Yoruba, and my mom's from River State. They're both from Nigeria. And I thought this was so interesting to see um, the influence of like the Yoruba tribe. 
um, there's over 200 tribes in Nigeria, and Yoruba is one of the largest tribes. Um, I don't really have any questions, but I just think it's important. Like, I'm first generation. I was born in America, but, you know, a lot of us don't really know much about our history. And then also, if we do know our history, it's really from our family. And so I think it's really great that we learn different types of cultures. Um, so thank you for having this talk. And I was wondering, there is a talk that's going to be virtual online. Is it going to be the same talk as this, or is it going to be something different? The one on April 6th? I think so. It's going to be different. Okay. Um, it's going to be with a professor of um, African diaspora, uh, African studies called uh, Relinda Rabaka, and he's at the University of Boulder, Colorado. And he uh, published in 2015 a book called The Negritude. And we will be looking at the show a little bit, but focusing on three artworks in particular. And he's going to be um, discussing his book um, specifically. So related, but different. And I hope you'll tune in for that. Thank you so much, Martina, and thank you so much for coming today. Great, thank you.